Hi, Augustine. Right, my time for me to wield your. Okay, so I am now at 5.10 and I think it is time to stop. So, um, first of all, I would, am going to give an overview of how or, uh, we are going to contextualize mobile. Le oh, 11 a.m., I'm so sorry. All right, well, it's on the dot. <laughs> Helga, hi Helga. Helga and I started our masters together. It's nice to see you online. No, I've, I've, uh, sorry, sorry, Lawrence. I've got all the control. Oh, Spain, hi Spain. Okay, Northern England, Portugal. Right, here we go. Um, so, hopefully this works. There we go. I'm going to cover, this is a bit more about mobile use, and then we're going to look at the context of this use, and then I will um, outline the mobile learning curriculum framework. Now, first of all, it's not a mobile learning curriculum. It's a mobile learning curriculum framework. And the reason for that being that we try to cover just about everything for everyone, which is to start off with, an impossible thing to do. So, in doing that, um, the idea is that institutions would have to kind of adapt and adopt it themselves. So, um, if we thank you for this, Carolina. If we look at the evolution of or revolution of technology or teaching aids then this goes back to the 1970s where students can't prepare Bob to calculate their problems. They depend on the slates, which are more expensive. It sounds like tablets. They will do, the, uh, what if their slate drops and it breaks? I've heard this exact argument in 2012 in a teaching conference. Students today depend too much on paper. Hmm, ballpoint pens will ruin education of the country. So what we are facing is in an evolution or a revolution of new things that it is really a different thing. The problem with mobile technology is that I think it is the first technology that's been a revolution more than an evolution. And the reason for that is that students now have access to knowledge in their pockets. In other words, it's not a case of the teacher giving them the technology anymore. And in a, in a way, it reinvents who the teacher is in the class because um, since the students are now connected to the rest of the world and connected, connected to knowledge from all over the world, the fact that we're asking questions in classes that are still being able to Google, you can Google the answer with, is problematic. Knowledge has shifted. It's not what you know, it's what you can do with it. And as long as we still try and portray the knowledge and say, all right, um, when I do this with teachers and they say to me, but you know the children can cheat with mobile phones, my question is why are you asking things that you can actually Google the answer for? You shouldn't be doing that. So the adoption models per se of technology has been disrupted. Now by adoption model I mean the headmaster or the um, organization decides to implement a certain technology, they go out, they buy it, they, they roll it out, they train everyone, and last of all, the end users would be the children. Today, the technology is individual, it's personal, and it's in the wild. There is no 
organized way of using it. So to a large extent, we're not working with adoption models anymore. We're working with inter oh, I can't do this. Where can I type it? We're working with integration models. In other words, how do I integrate this technology into an environment? And up until now, we've been very, very reactive with our implementation of mobile technology. In other words, because the children have the technology, the institution now thought it was a good, good idea. So in, in a certain way, we have to take back control or be more proactive. And this is where the mobile learning curriculum came to. Um, the question is that is mobile technology really so different? And I think the difference comes in, in that institutional control, access to the technology, the actual technology that's being used, the content of it, which is being, these are all user initiated much rather than institution in, initiated. Um, access is determined by what the child wants to access or the student technology, what technology the student wants. If you actually give them old technology, they rip out the new technology and use it. The content, uh, you can ban Facebook at school, but they go home and look at Facebook there. Um, the way in which they use it, all this has changed dramatically. So in a way, the gatekeeper is dead. Um, institutional access access and control has died. The problem is that it's not dead. Insti schools and institutions are reacting by actually banning the technology. So we're banning learning technology because the children are preoccupied instead of actually using the technology. There's a school in South Africa that actually uses mobile, they have and banned mobile technology, and they've actually had very, very, very few problems with technology at school because they're teaching the children how to use it. So in a way, at schools, we have a naive user base, but a very, very knowledgeable user base. Knowledgeable about tools, but definitely not knowledgeable about how to actually integrate this into their lives. And at the moment, no one's on playground duty. So in schools, we definitely need to get out onto the playground. And at universities, we definitely need to access and use this technology that's available. But how? <laughs> I like your question, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> so let's just first run through the things that you would have to consider to do this. Firstly, who's my users? When you're planning a curriculum, you need to have what would you say? Intimate knowledge of who you are actually addressing. If we're working with school children, then we all know that they'd rather forget their lunch at home than they would their, their uh, phones. They actually have integrated mobile phones right across their lives. And uh, much like the 1950s burger joints, it's now become a case of my phone is my extension to life. In South Africa, Africa, and I think to a certain extent in uh, India, uh, whoever's from India might just give us an indication if this is correct, we don't have personal access as much as shared access. In other words, my phone is obviously used by a number of people to access content and services. What would happen is that you would keep your SIM card Oh, and then one child, of course, has a number of SIM cards as well. Um, if you look at, uh, this is, comes from uh, US Teens, which is slightly biased to not reading and not being online. And if you compare that to the world, where most of our subscriptions are actually in the developing world. Um, and the developing world, contrary to what you might believe, have a lot of phones. In Africa, 
everyone has access. I'm not saying ownership at all access to mobile technology. In India, I'm not so sure if we share, but I'm sure that the shared model is applicable. I saw someone from India, maybe they can give us an indication of uh, the outline in India. In Europe, America, this is much more of an individual um, interaction. And this is where the problem comes in of what exactly is it the definition for mobile learning because it depends I'll, I'll run through a few examples now so if we talk about the access of mobile te technology um, the, the developing world is by definition mobile centric and they extend their mobile capabilities to PC so we've entered the, uh, the information oops this, this is wrong We've entered the information age from mobiles, and um, mobile-centric users mostly have a single device on which they do everything. PC-centric is more your Europe, Americas, uh, to a certain extent Finland, um, definitely maybe a large part of uh, the Pacific Rim. People with PC-centric usually have different de devices, specific devices. They have a GPS, they have a camera, they have a phone, they have a uh, alarm clock, they have, they have, they have, they have. We're mobile-centric, we tend to have one phone which we use for everything. Ah, okay, so um, the, inform the way in which we look at the technology is different. That's why it's so terribly difficult to design something in Europe for Africa or for a in Africa for Europe because the context of use is so terribly different. Okay, so let's have a look at a concept of mobile-centric. I'm not going to go into the concept of PC-centric because I think that is the general accepted norm. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the mobile centric just to give you an idea of the other. So in mo this is a thank you very much to Microsoft Research. This is a 25 year old hairdresser and he's barely finished high school. He discovered the mobile internet while exploring URLs on, on his phone and he now has a Facebook account, a Mixit profile. Now Mixit is a, a local South African social network working service which work with works with instant messaging and um, it has been terribly successful I mean it has around about 50 oops 50 million users currently and he's basically a contributor as well as a participant in the information age but he's never gone near a computer and he only has one phone as technology Another example that I put, another example, ah, this is a young lady that, were, uh, that stays in rural South Africa and she used a number of online learning uh, services and in the end of this year her maths was 92%, physical science 92% and her life sciences 92%. The interesting thing here is that lady sitting there is her aunt. And she doesn't own a phone, so she used the aunt's phone on a uh, local um, service provider, Selfie, and through Selfie, Mixit is free. And she used these services, which I'll show you some more now, to actually train for school. In the last term of her matric year, she didn't have a math teacher. So this is work on her own through mobile learning. Uh, this is some of the services that is currently on Mixit. And there's about 43 of the services. But what is interesting is if you see there's 3.7 uh, million children that are using these services. Uh, the service that this uh, little girl was using in the previous example is called... Um, Quiz Max, there it is. Um, there we go. And she was using another service called Dr. Maths, which I'll give you some examples for there. And there 
where they were. And this is last year. Since last year, these numbers have changed dramatically. Um, okay. So when you consider who your user is, the next question that you should ask yourself is, how can I actually reach them? Now, this is where you have to make some serious uh, uh, choices, and this is where the cost comes in. If it's an informal service, then you kind of work with you providing content on the technology that's already owned. If you are going to roll out technology, it becomes a very, very expensive thing. So let's have a look at the different channels. When you have a low-end phone, now the low-end phone is the old black and white screens, then you basically stuck to voice services, SMS, and USSD. And there's no option about that. Um, in South Africa, they use a lot of missed calls. In other words, they send a message through the missed calls. And sometimes there's a callback. I know there's a service in India that also uses voice services, um, uh, which is called BBC Jamala. Um, we, some of our, most of the services that are in the developing context actually uses SMS. When you go to feature phones, you try and tend to get more. You have your instant message services, which um, is when Mixit comes in. Um, you have MMS, which has never kind of been very successful. Bluetooth is successful because it's kind of three free. WAP has never been a success. Um, applications for uh, web, um, feature phones has not been very successful. And then if you get to smartphones, then of course mobile, web, Wi-Fi, and apps become a definite option. Okay. Um, so what can you do with a phone? Now under phone, please loosely your smartphone, your tablets would fall under your smartphone um, as well. So both, um, I just didn't incorporate them here, but your smartphones, tablets, um, basic basic phones can make calls, text, feature phones. Here we go. We listen to the radio, which is a big thing in uh, Africa. Download ringtones, run mix it. Mix it is the in, uh, is the um, instant messaging service that I just told you about, and then smartphones applications or app stores become a reality. However, app stores is not going to help you one little bit if you don't have access to the internet. So another concept that we've been working with is nodes of access, and I will explain that to you when I get to the specific example a little bit later on. Right. Um, so bring on the tablet. The tablet is alive and well in Africa. And um, there are tablets that are very affordable under $100, uh, dollar, 100 euro in South Africa, which we are using for various things. So when I talk about mobile phones, please just throw in tablets there. E-book readers is also, also, of course, a very big reality to consider. And this because of the lack of electricity that we have in the rural um, areas. Ebooks, the reason that I don't like ebooks is that you kind of turn around and say, why? Why ebooks if you can't use normal books? I do believe that it has to add value to some interaction. That's debatable, it's just my opinion. Right, so if you look at this, here is the possibilities, and this is just a nice picture to kind of put you in the uh, in the picture of what I'm talking about. Okay, so what do I want to enable is your next question. What on earth is it that I want to enable? And here I'm going to go through a number of interactions. And this would also explain to you when I'm finished why a definition of mobile learning seems to be so far off. Um, when you look at the mobile interaction, um, mobile phones bring mobility and it brings context into a uh, uh, reaction. So if you look at um, putting low mobility and high mobility, low context and high context. Now under low mobility, I am implying that the mobile, the being mobile is not so important. And I'll show you some examples where that is true. High mobility is that being mobile is critical. Low context, the context, the environment does not 
feed in on the interaction. High context would imply that the context does feed in on the interaction. So, this is an example of, let me just go back here. This is an example of the realities of some parts of the world. This is what we call a cell phone tree. And that young man, if he stands there, and he holds the phone there, I am told that he gets a signal for a little while. Here, it's also local knowledge yeah, that you have to stand, and this is the best place for reception. So we can't assume the same circumstances throughout the whole world when we talk about mobile learning. Because this, the fact that we are, are using mobile technology is not because we're connected. It's not because these people have instant high band, broadband, 3G broadband connectivity the whole time. It's not existing. And in very large parts of the world, this is still a reality. And I would hate to tell this to the people in Finland, but Johansu really doesn't have good 3G. All right, so the first um, interaction that I'd like to look at is your low mobility, low context. And then it's often about the ability. Uh, low mobility it means I don't have to move. It's not about moving around. Low context is the environment actually doesn't feed in on it. And this is your most obvious interaction in many uh, developing contexts. For example, Dr. Maths is a system that connects learners to tutors through uh, a system. And they tutor the children. At the moment, there are uh, a number of tutors online, I see. And I'll give you the link a little later on. And you can actually join them and ask a few questions. We, we're using uh, students from universities to tutor um, school children in um, schools, uh, in after school with homework to help them. Um, so here we are. The school, the school children get connected through Mixit to Dr. Math. Um, as I say, the advantage of Dr. Math and the service provider called CellC is that it is free to end user. This is the informal learning, and we make use of the children's own technology. So they are actually connecting for free through any feature phone available. Here is an example of what Dr. Math did. Um, this is a, a bot, and you'll see that this young lady with the name of Pimpstar, and I can only assume she calls herself Pimpstar because there was no one to help her, um, is asking for help. And so the factors of the polynomial, this is a little bit of a game that they play online, and she's supposed to solve the poly uh, polynomials of this. Now she's getting this wrong, but she plays on and off for five hours. We managed to get a child from rural Africa to do five hours of math. After that, she becomes the top scorer, and look what she does. She goes and tries on other names. So she changes her name from Pimp Star to Queen of Math. And she tries that a little bit, and then she decides, uh-uh, no, I'd much rather be Smarty Cat. So we changed Pimp Star to Smarty Cat from a few, within a few hours, on her own, after about six hours of play. Let me just show you another example. Um, Dr. Loss is uh, a system also run locally, where we are, where teachers, uh, the teacher focus, and they are using learners to get the teachers um, active on the internet. So the Learners are already online and chatting away in Mixit, and they're using it to train teachers to become ICT literate. OK, another example. Contact, Shuttleworth Foundation. It's about literacy. This is a book that was published online, and they had about 30,000 readers. If you look at this, then the chapter views for Contact 1 and 2 within the first two weeks. And if this was a normal book, this would be a bestseller. 
the interesting thing was that they allowed the children to give feedback. And what was so nice is the way that the children complained about the spelling errors in context. Um, dissection for all, high school, local high school, used dissections and they made mobile videos of the whole um, grade 11 dissection. And this was put online and children from throughout the world, mostly South Africa of course, uh, downloaded these videos. I actually know that some of these videos are currently making its way um, to Argentina. So maybe we, they'll see them there soon. Um, here's the use of mobile technology in class. The teacher used it to take photos of uh, specific instances and the kids went and drew it a go. I want you to have a look here. We often ask, is the screen too small? No, the screen is actually not too small. And they don't mind sharing and they don't mind using it. These photos come out of a school in uh, Pretoria where mobile technology is actually not banned but used by the teacher to enhance her lear uh, learning and teaching practice. What did they learn? Well, they presented their work at conferences and they passed this on to local clinics where the sisters shared it with patients there. Yeah, mobile journalists, absolutely true. They become mobile journalists. So, um, Low mobility, high context, oops, that's in the wrong area, it should be there, apologies. Um, low mobility, high context, oops, no, sorry, I'm so sorry. There we go. I don't know, where's my eraser? I'm not even going to try and find it. Low mobility, high context is, what, okay, let me just go back. When you look at what the example that I've given you, this is what we often refer to as mobile learning in the South African or developing context. When you look at low mobility and high context, then this is kind of what they refer to mobile learning in the Pacific Rim and mostly in America. Because what happens here is every child has a device, mostly provided by the school. You have two-way interaction and they log onto a learning management system. Um, examples of this is the Nokia MoMA system where the children did math and then their marks got sent to a learning management system and the teacher could actually look it up. So here is some of the stuff on the mobile maths, uh, linear equations, equations, common fractions, trinomials. Um, and if you want more information on this, I actually think Jacqueline would be the person to ask. Uh, they gave examples which you could solve. Um, so once you've done it, it also showed the steps, it gave the rules, but the child had a history. So in other words, we knew who the child was and the child's interactions was logged onto a learning system which was then later overviewed by the teacher. Um, this is an example of a young lady that logged in on day one and her score was 11.25 and on day five, after 21 tries, she hit the 15 and she stayed with 15. She made very sure that she was doing it. Instant feedback um, and support through teachers logging onto a system. Okay, this is also journal access where you've got a, a history, you log on, um, learning management extensions, very nice for one-to-one -one learning in classrooms. And this is mostly what is called mobile learning in the America and European context. Here's another example of something like this called Quizmax, which has got some questions and then children log on and try and do the questions. And the child has a history and this is given back to the teacher. So the child's access is mobile but the teacher still has access to it. So it's a different type of access to a learning management system. When we're working with high mobility, low context, then we're sitting there. This is, yes, I know that this is not supposed to happen, but this is when your learner has the attention span of a amoeba. And this is mostly used when, um, let me give you some examples. Traveling from one point to another, 
um, contextual mobility, in other words, sitting in the field, finding birds, then you need to have be mobile, but you also need to be able to log on where you are. Uh, it doesn't really matter who you are, it just matters that you log on. Another nice example is Afri Doctor. Um, Carolina, maybe you can give some um, examples here. Um, Carolina designed a lovely uh, game that they were playing in Uensu, and this is also kind of a contextual mob mobility. I'm sorry, I should have put that in. You need to give me some slides at this stage, girl. QR codes are another example of this, where the mo mobility of something is important and where you link to is important. High mobility, high contact, that is what we call mobile learning in the UK. Um, and look where that is, it's totally in the wrong place, it should be there. Um, so high context, high mobility, this is for example when you're standing in a museum and the GPRS picks up that you've been standing for five minutes in front, in front of a Picasso and it tells you if you go down around the corner there's another Picasso out of his blue period which you might find interesting. Um, I've got some design criteria here, um, but what is important is that the environment actually feeds in on what the person is doing. So this is what, what you have when you have um, uh, reality being overlaid on your mobile phone. It's uh, when you um, augmented reality falls under this, uh, running around Stratford on Avon with sensors falls under this. Um, so basically, all those just boil down to an interactive, quiz-based style of teaching where immediate feedback is what it's about. So, what is this mobile learning curriculum and how does this actually help you to get round to one of these? Now, the reason why I go, went through these examples is to kind of try and broaden your perspective of what mobile learning is. It's not a single, okay, let me just go here. It's not a, a definition of what mobile learning is. It's very much debated, and I think it's also debated in this channel. But so the, it reflects the focus of the community that puts it forward. In other words, solution-based technology will define mobile learning through the technology that they use. Uh, research in mobile learning, uh, or, or which is concerned with learning, we'll more talk about the learning. Uh, a lovely definition coming from the UK is mobility. It's the mobility of the user or the mobility of whatever. But in Africa, that's that's all odd to us. Because we really don't run around the way to with sensors. We do it because this is what is affordable and available. So another uh, perspective of mobile learning, oh, here we go, is in terms of the mobility. So I don't think that what we're going to get in one go is uh, a definition for mobile learning that's going to cover everything. It is a phenomenon that happens in context. And if we can broaden our mind to exactly what it is, it makes a development of a curriculum so much richer. So the curriculum was developed as follows. It's a design research that's taking place. Phase one was getting experts from all over the world and harvesting topics from the domain. From here we develop a conceptual mobile learning curriculum. It has gone through expert review and update and a version two was presented. We are now at phase three where practitioner review and update is happening. And that is what I really hope that you can do for us, is that you will go to the links that I've provided and update or give feedback on relevant issues. Uh, you'll see if you look that uh, the first theme today is under discussion, and I would really appreciate your feedback on this. So, what would then happen is that there would be regional feedbacks, most probably in South Africa, Africa, UK, USA, and whoever else invites us. And from there on, um, we'd like to make it available to everyone. Uh, course creation is actually happening at the moment. I know that of a number of universities that are actually working uh, with us to create mobile learning curriculums. Um, I think there's a master, master's currently under development in mobile learning as an elective. 
and I will share with you um, the mobile training for in-service teachers that we are currently working with. Um, whoever, oh yes, and then the inf International um, Association, International, I, Jacqueline, where were we? I, uh, I O L. Um, anyway, they are also basing some of the work on this. So a def okay, sorry, whoops, next one, next one. Okay, oh no, um, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so the mobile learning curriculum framework as current is basically a snapshot of the field. And we need to get it processed before it's outdated. So part one consists of the mobile learning curriculum framework and part two will consist of some examples of courseware. Um, the, uh, the reason for this is that we saw that as the conversations were changing from whether mobile learning is a strategic option to how it can be operationalized, the question of how do what do we do facilitators become more and more important. So we went along and this is what we've designed. Um, the mobile learning curriculum is then a first attempt to systematically and comprehensively explore where and how mobile should or can appear in the e educational provision. We've got it under themes that are divided into subheadings uh, and they embody a type of a te taxonomy uh, and a way of representing and organizing the themes of the context. The endeavor assumes that learning with mobiles is part of a very wide interaction between technology, mobility, and the environment. So it doesn't put mobile learning in a separate case. Um, the mobile learning curriculum is built on three premises. Firstly, to know, which is the acquisition of the main knowledge. To do, in other words, the skills to do um, mobile learning. And then to understand. There are a number of things that sh the impact of the main knowledge in relation to the application contexts remains important. For example, um, the technology that comes loose, what on earth are we going to do with all these uh, technology that is being thrown away on a two yearly basis? Um, what do we do with local knowledge? How do we facilitate the creation of no local knowledge or the application of knowledge in a local personalized domain? So. Not only should we know what mobile learning is, but we should be able to do it and to understand it. And this is where uh, um, creating an adaption of the mobile learning becomes a bit of a challenge. Because if it's an academic endeavor, then to know might be more important than to do. I do think that to understand should always feature. If you are planning an intervention to help, um, what do you call it, um, managers and um, management of an institution to become more aware of mobile learning, then I think to understand becomes very important. Where if you're doing an in-service training for teachers, to do might become important. Um, Jacqueline is currently constructing a mobile learning uh, curriculum where it's an academic endeavor and she's balanced things to, to know with to do. Because uh, I do believe that um, you should teach mobile learning through mobile learning, which is a bit of a challenge in what we're doing. So I'm saying let's teach mobile learning through mobile learning, and I'm actually sitting on a computer talking. Sorry about that. I do apologize. OK, so our themes that or it identified was the impact of mobile, the impact of mobiles on the economy, the impact of mobiles on learning. And here we had a choice. How do you divide the environment of mobile learning? And we did it in formal and informal learning seemed to be the most natural. The nature of technology, and this is why we Carolina and her team in UNSU come in very handy. Carolina is also busy with a um, mobile learning curriculum, also an instance of this curriculum. And she has, Mo Carolina, <coughs> remember, um, volunteered to complete this for us in how many instances still needed to happen. Becoming mobile, this is um, 
changing a school or an environment that is mobile unfriendly into a mobile friendly environment, which basically covers your uh, governance, policy, vision, planning and pedagogy, practicing in the administration and etc. So, institutions basically need to adapt, adopt and implement the curriculum by looking at their local needs. We cannot go and design a mobile learning curriculum for everyone, but at least there is a framework which you can take to pull out and see what is relevant where. So, Considering your own user, your own context, and your own focus, you need to institutionalize or adapt this curriculum framework to suit you. Um, here is an instance of what we're doing with this in an area called Kofenwabu. And here you can see Kofenwabu, the school is just below, behind there. Uh, this is in the Eastern Cape, extremely rural. The teachers um, have a computer or two at school, but it is not really being used. Limited 3G access, really limited. So because there's limited 3G access, we're working on a model that we call nodes of access. And these nodes of access is basically a mobile Wi-Fi environment. We are giving the teachers technology, but because I absolutely hate giving teachers or people technology, it's against my religion. Um, we've, we're working on a principle called, called earn as you learn. So earn as, you learn, earn as you learn means that the teachers can keep the technology if they can prove that they are using it. So the idea is um, that at the end of this, oops, sorry, that the teachers will have a uh, technology Base. In other words, they will have technology that they can use in class. They will have pedagogical principles. In other words, they will have technology that they know how to use in class. Now, this has been so successful that we did a number of uh, uh, strategies, teaching strategies with them in the first lesson. And when we left, we actually heard that they were all using it this in the class and as well as in um, interventions in the staff room. So it is possible. Um, and I, as I say, I'm more than willing to share everything that is here with whoever. This is nothing is a secret. <laughs> secret. It just has to, we're currently in the third iteration, so we're getting there. All right, this is the school where we're doing it. It's a, a school called Arthur and Fabi, a senior secondary school, and they're 200 children. Now, the interesting thing is in the school, everyone has access to a feature phone at least and most of them actually own one. So we've introduced a number of services that they can use, but we've given tablets to the teachers. There's the tablets that we've given to the teachers. They are um, not branded tablets, and they're about they're under 100 uh, euros each, but they have 3G. Um, and what the teachers are doing is we have 10 lessons which we are going through, how to teach them, and as I say, we go back and once they've achieved certain learning goals, so it's kind of gamification of learning for teachers as well. We're on module three happening now, and we are going slowly from uh, giving them and teaching them in a way in which we predict everything to actually leaving them alone. I don't think that... Um, just giving a workshop and running away is ever really going to be successful. Please, if you want access to these uh, workbooks, please let me know. And of course, as I said, you're more than welcome to share them. So uh, over a series of 10 lessons, we ha have um, the acquisition of knowledge, which happens in the first two lessons. Then contact lesson three to nine is developing the actual skills to teach with it. And then in the last lesson, it would be to com comprehend the role and the impact of what they are doing. And we are building the technology skills, pedagogical skills, and technology tools. This is, I think, a student of Jacqueline and mine that is doing um, a, a master's on this, which we'll also publish. And if you're interested, once it's been published, of course, you're happy. 
Um, you can see how terribly happy these people are. These are people that have never worked with technology before. And you see that little bag that she's got there? That was an earn as you learn. So in other words, if they completed their school, what, 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 vision and strategy and whatever, they received that. Um, and if you can't beat them, join them, yeah. Thank you very much. I see that there's big conversations that was happening here that I didn't follow. Um, I hope that we can put uh, carry on with the conversations on the forum. And thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> now, earn as your learn approach, yeah. Okay. So, questions? Let me see. I can... I, I, I can't open these mics. Anyway, I don't know how to open the mics. They don't want to open. They don't give me the ability to open them. Sorry. I was trying just now with Carolina and I couldn't open them. Sorry, we're all on writing. Uh, oh, thank you, Lorraine. It's a pleasure. I'm glad that it was useful for you. Is there something that you would like me to cover more? The, um, Will the PowerPoint be posted? I assume so. Can't you download it from there? But I will post it. Yes, that's a very good idea. Thank you. I will post it. Uh, please just don't spread it too widely because I stole some of the pictures. For example, this one was stolen. I don't have copyright on it, but it was so cute. Yes, please ask. Oh, you mean the sharing? Yes, okay. We'll share. Um, oh, here's a question. Um, the full mobile learning curriculum framework, yes. The full le mobile learning curriculum framework is available. Um, once I've updated it with all the information and credit to people that have contributed to it, I will post it on um, the mobile learning, uh, the MOOC, and um, as I say, it's it's in a process of getting finished, but at the moment at least it will give you some indication of what
is definitely needed is I need much more resources and examples in there. Um, the, the, the sum of the resources in there is very uh, localized and mostly skewed to the contributors' context, which is South Africa. So I would really like to include some Indian and German and Australian uh, community, oh, com indigenous communities in Australia. Ah, well, excellent. Okay, that we, we're very close to um, kind of sharing that. Earn as you learn. Yes, earn as you learn works like a bomb. Um, <laughs> it works like a bomb. It works really, really well. Because if you don't use it, you don't get it. It's the first time in my life I've had 100% attendance for everything. <laughs> Can you give some more clarity on what will happen in the future work science to refine the curriculum? Yes, I think basically what would happen with the refining of the curriculum is that when you build a university curriculum on something like this, it does need to have some um, accreditation. It needs to have gone through a rather rigorous process. So it will, in a way, be a localized instance of the curriculum framework. Can you give more examples of Earn As You Learn? OK, um, yes. Uh, for Ernestine Lund, sorry, for Ernest, do you have them use the technology while you're teaching? Yes. Okay, so let me give you an example of what we did. I'll go back to this. Oh, gosh, look at that. It's gone. Okay, hang on. Okay. All right, I have to first of all explain that. Um, I've been in schools, out of schools, in universities, out of universities, uh, um, implementing mobile learning in a number of contexts. And the thing that's always got me from all of these instances is that the moment you give technology to a group of people, the ownership of the technology and the responsibility of the technology and everything lies with you as an instructor. So we had to come up with a way in which we could actually change this around and revert uh, the uh, ownership to the people receiving the technology. We did this by saying, all right, we don't mind giving you technology if you're using it for what we are envisaging. So if we give it to you for teaching and learning, we want you to use it for teaching and learning. So what we did to start off with is we gave everyone a tab. And they had a number of um, uh, points that they had to earn. So we expect them to earn something like 100 points. And they get five points for implementing it in class, five points for this, five points for that. And it's been so successful <laughs> that these teachers are rocking up <laughs> at um, um, uh, district meetings with their tablets and actually taking photos of them using their tablet at this district meeting to make notes. And then they email this to us to show that they are actually using it. Um, so the, the idea is that if you use the technology, you can have it. And if you use it correctly, we will enable you to the next step. So if we do apps with them, we give them airtime. If we do, oh, where's the next one? Let me show you. Um, if we do um, mm, e-books with them, then those of them that are using it, they get an extra SD card and a flash disk. I see Jacqueline has given that. Uh, if they achieve certain goals, then they earn a projector, for example, which they can use in their classes to teach. So the earn is, yeah, it's a case of enabling the use of the technology um, in such a way that you actually are using it. So what is, uh, what is what I also experienced? Don't give them, yes, yes, okay. So there's a few instances here of people that have also 
gone through it and it doesn't work if you just give technology. Do you have more information about the project you are working on, what kind of uh, participation we can have? Oh, that would be fantastic if you want some participation. Yes, I do have more. Um, we are currently... <laughs> I'd love to get everyone involved here. Um, the next step is to kind of take this uh, mobile learning inst curriculum instance and mash it down to something that can be rolled out in large scale. We have uh, next year that 6,000 children in 25 schools in <laughs> rural Kofenwabu will be receiving tablets. So, <laughs> who wants to help? Yes, please help. <laughs> But yes, I, um, just please give me an email, a boeta at um, csir.co.za and uh, outline your specific interest. And uh, of course, uh, there's research to be done until we all dead of it. And work, lots and lots and lots of work. Um, as I'm a designer and I design a lot of different content, my address. Ah, oh, Karelina, sorry, I, lo I lost the track of that. Okay. Okay, I think our oh, questions are answered. Um, Karelina uh, comes into mobile learning from a more uh, technical point of view. Um, indigenous people up there, yes. Uh, what we do find, um, Russell, is that um, co-creation is exceptionally important. Co-creation and local ownership. Um, the technology is 10% of what happens in an institution to be able to be used in such a way that it enhances learning. Uh, um, co-creation, 100%, yeah. There's a... Um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the living labs. Um, which enhance, which gives some uh, co-creation and co-ownership and co-guidelines. Uh, so we worked from uh, the living labs, and I think there's a lot of them in Finland as well. And that's basically what we've worked from. Uh, co-creation, local ownership is current through, yes. And it has to be sustainable, otherwise it just doesn't help. I don't want to walk out of the school tomorrow and all my efforts just fall flat. Um, the same with universities. We've got an instance happening where we're training lecturers in order to lecture. And yes, uh, the mobile learning is half of it, but the other half is actually also enabling them with tools. Carolina says, listen, and I agree with that. The curriculum should be adapted to the environment. I think that's what you have been saying. Yes, Helga, that is what I have been saying. <laughs> Um, it's a framework. You need to take out of it what is um, applicable and throw away what's not applicable. I hope that by the end of next year that we have a number of examples of how this has been uh, implemented and if how it's working in practice. Um, this is why the curriculum is a framework. Yes, 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 yes. Agreed. Um, I don't think one person can design, a, one group of people can design a curriculum for contexts that you don't understand because the local context is exceptionally important. Okay. No, 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 sign, or no one size fits all solution, unfortunately. Wish it was. No, it doesn't. But uh, that being said, um, you can learn from those that have fit it already. So there are examples out there that has been worked. What I am absolutely very passionate about is that you need to walk the talk. So if you're going to do a mobile learning curriculum, you should actually do it through mobile technology. <laughs> You can't do a mobile, and, and by mobile learning, I'm not talking about only one understanding of mobile learning. I'm talking about all four of those um, 
uh, bits of mobile learning where it presents itself. In other words, low context, high context, low mobility, high mobility, it doesn't matter. In other words, it, it's not a, uh, think of it, hmm, I don't know. Think of it as Lego blocks, and the Lego blocks need to be put together in a way that it actually makes sense to whoever is using it and learning from it. But ultimately, the goal of mobile learning is learning. Okay, guys. Um, uh, example in Australia from a wonderful indigenous teacher is called PD in a Box Context. Oh, thank you very much for that. I will. Do you have a contact address for her? Um, I'm wondering, oh, thank you very much, and I'll send you, yes, please, at Right. Uh, last chance for questions. Yes, please. You've been a wonderful bunch of people. I haven't heard about you and I've had a whole hour to just talk. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I should have tried to make it more in interactive there. I just didn't know. Yes, definitely time for tea. It is now 6 p.m. South African time. And yes, it's time to go home. Time for dinner. Yes, absolutely time for dinner. Past time for dinner. <laughs> oh, 9 a.m. Oh, gosh, you've got the entire day still to live, Lorraine. Good luck to you. Ah, 1 p.m. in Argentina. Hmm. Okay. And there we are.